Well, hello, this is our review of chapter 17. Chapter 17 is the last chapter in the book, and it is a new chapter. Um, the old uh, first edition, the final chapter, dealt with purchasing cards. And in this book, we dealt with the purchasing card example running through the early chapters. So, uh, the two main themes here, prevention is far better than detection. And number two, when it comes to detection, we still have a long way to go. So, the annual cost of employee fraud. We get all sorts of numbers bandied about. I thought, how about I make up some numbers and see what comes out. I'm estimating the average fraud loss, and I'm talking about embezzlement only over here at 400,000. The median is reported quite often, but never the average. So that's my estimate of the average. According to the uh, report to the nations, only 58% are referred to law enforcement. I saw that we have 15,000 arrests at the federal level, and it is pretty constant from year to year. Actually, it's going down a little bit of late. And uh, interestingly enough, interesting split, uh, uh, an even split between men and women. Let's also estimate that half of all cases are not detected. Um, gives us a conservative loss of 20.7 billion annually in the United States from embezzlement. This is quite close to the total revenues of Southwest Airlines, uh, one of our biggest airlines. So you can almost imagine that uh, if all the fraudsters stole their money, they could actually pay everybody to fly on Southwest Airlines for free for a year, year after year after year. The legal process, it's an adversarial process, which is what makes law and order interesting. Prosecutor and defense attorney put, put their wits against each other. Um, that also makes for interesting TV. The jury declares the winner and the judge decides on the sentence. In court, our defense attorneys and the prosecuting attorneys present opposing versions of the truth. Winning requires a guilty virgins, verdict and some type of sentence. Note, the courtroom oath to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth only applies to witnesses. And we saw that in the Charlene Corley chapter where there was a motion for a prison delay and the um, defense attorney spoke about Charlene wanting more time to allow and to identify assets so that the government could seize them. All the assets except, of course, for that nice house. The defense attorney wants the truth not to surface. And now we've jumped ahead here. There we go. Um, the prosecution has the least powerful arsenal. Rights of the defendant, unreasonable searches and seizures, right to a grand jury, which means um, some good evidence has to be presented before we would even consider indicting you, double jeopardy being charged twice, don't have to self-incriminate, Miranda rights require law enforcement to tell detainees that they can remain silent. You have the right to due process. A jury trial and a speedy trial. But for all of these, there are exceptions. And indeed, for minor offenses, for which uh, we only impose maybe a monetary penalty, you don't have the right to a jury trial. Uh, accused has the right to an assistance of counsel. So the defendant not in such a bad position. Now, defenses against an embezzlement charge. One defense strategy is to try and establish a reasonable doubt by using the government's own witnesses. And here we want to try and um, say something about the credibility of the witnesses. Number two, in excuse defenses, no criminal responsibility. And examples here include self-defense, defense of others, coercion, 
the lesser of two evils. I had no alternative. I was intoxicated. The statute of limitations, a certain time has passed, but note, the defense must, have, this defense must be raised right after the start of the proceedings, otherwise the person is seen to have waived that defense. Another defense is the claim of right to the property made in good faith. Um, and in the book, we talk about the O.J. Simpson trial, and this is not the one for the 1990s. This is the one where O.J. went to retrieve what he believed was his own property. Now, we have crime and we have economists and uh, Becker at the University of Chicago came up with the economics of crime model and this has stood the test of time. So, the model is set out in terms of the expected utility, the good feeling or the benefit for the offender from committing the offense. Uh, utility refers to the total satisfaction received from the fruits of the uh, crime. Using some calculus and uh, derivatives and interesting things like that, the results show that an increase in the chance of detection and conviction would reduce the expected utility. When it comes to the monetary penalties, an increase in the monetary equivalent of the punishment, so longer prison time, would reduce the expected utility from the offence. So, in summary, higher chances of detection, higher levels of punishment, both lower the expected utility from the criminal act. Internal controls. Uh, we looked at this in one of the previous chapters and we talked about, we had this one first, the reporting objectives relate to the internal, external, financial and non-financial reporting. So, we would like accuracy in our financial reports, effectiveness and efficiency of the entity's operations, and compliance with relative, rel relative laws. So, occupational fraud fits in over here with the effectiveness and efficiency of the entity's operations, including safeguarding the assets against a loss. There's a good reference over there. We saw this at the end of the Charlene Corley case, um, and I spoke about this briefly in a page there. Preventive controls prevent the incident from happening in the first place. Detective controls try to detect the errors or incidents that have eluded the preventive controls. Corrective controls, in summary, try to fix things up. Here we go. This is from the report to the nations. A lack of internal controls contributed to nearly one third of frauds. So this is a lack. This isn't even uh, weak controls. So fraud risk assessments. One would think this was something you could do just before the coffee break in the morning. Not so. If we go to the ACFE's page on fraud risk assessments, it's voluminous. This is a serious job and it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of time, especially where the company has different lines of business and operates in different geographic areas. We identify the inherent fraud risks, the chances. We assess the chances of the fraud and the significance of the amount. We evaluate which people and departments are most likely to commit fraud and the methods that they might use. We identify the preventive and detective controls that are operating. We evaluate whether those controls are working properly. And then we identify and evaluate the remaining fraud risks that exist because of a lack of controls or because these controls are not working effectively and efficiently. This is quite serious. Detective controls. 
These are the ones that we care about in the book. The main steps, collect the data, prepare the data, analyze the data, and report the results. These techniques are mainly used on transactional data, on ledger balances, the statistical data, and sometimes aggregated data. With this is uh, back to continuous monitoring. Um, the scope of the monitoring, the methods and techniques to be used, and the indicators to be used. And we looked at this uh, when we were talking about scoring forensic units. Management of supervisor reviews. And we saw this in the Victor Sturman case. Um, he left BP. And after his left, his um, successor started looking around and presumably picked up that something was wrong. When it comes to the duplicate payments, we also looked at the case of Ryan King. And again there, it was a case of the person that took uh, over afterwards uh, found problems with the reconciliations. Fraud detection methods. The ones that are relevant to us, these forensic and analytic type tests, are right over here. We would expect them to be done by internal audit or some uh, loss prevention department that's operating maybe as a satellite office of internal audit. 15% of the frauds are detected, we could say, through forensic anal analytics. 85% of the frauds that are detected were not detected by that method. We really can do much better. I enjoy reading the report to the nations. Let's have a look at uh, the latest one. And there we go. You can go to the ACFE's website. It's the 2020 report. It came out not too long ago. 88 pages <clears throat> on fraud, corruption, and financial statement fraud. It makes for wonderful reading. Other fraud prevention methods, we're almost done. Fraud awareness training. We've seen this time and time again as well. Harriet Walters lived lavishly, dressed lavishly, gave gifts to co-workers and the like, and no one said, where did she get the money from? One prevention method is management having integrity. Realistic budgets and performance goals. This is one that I believe is true. Excessive levels of executive pay could give rise to feelings of resentment and unfairness. And this could fall into that uh, fraud driver called rationalization. Owners of private companies should avoid underhand schemes and one fraudster told me this uh, in an interview. He said, I was told to do a whole lot of underhand things to make money for the company. And these would be in things like under-reporting certain liabilities like uh, workman's compensation, unemployment insurance, and the like. And I was told to do underhand things, so I didn't feel too bad about cheating them. A deterrent exists when employees believe the chances of detection are high. Employ people that are not predisposed to fraud. One of the uh, things we could do is look at background checks. And in the book, um, we had the Michelle Higson case. Um, she was committing fraud while under indictment and while being sentenced and serving jail time for another one. There are numerous examples of people going ahead and committing a second fraud. Employees that are paid in part, at least based on firm performance, should have at least a lower tendency to commit occupational fraud. So, almost done with my, with my final words. 500 pages, 203,000 words later, 
Let's have a look. The detection methods start with the high level tests. And here I want to identify things like completeness and data reliability. Then we moved on and looked at abnormal duplications. We then moved on and looked for outliers, numbers that just don't look like the rest of the crowd. We then used some time series methods in which we compared prior data to the current data and a large difference could signal fraud or error or that something has changed. We spoke about scoring forensic units, and this is something that is done regularly with every single credit card transaction that we, um, that we process or every loan that we apply to at a bank. We are scored and we are given a yes or a no. We looked at financial statement fraud, and I would almost want to say that the best I could offer you there is that we should learn from past experience. But you can really only learn from past experience if you know what past experience was. And indeed, I tried to outline some of past experience from the main cases, Enron, Health South, Worldcom. We need to start by saying, how would a fraudulent bias or erroneous transaction, how would it stand out from the crowd and let me go and design a test to identify this. These are our main tools, but we had a nice uh, several others that we included in our toolbox. Occupational fraud has the usual ingredients of an activity, an opportunity, a victim, something valuable and adversaries. But it is unique in that it's a repeated action in an environment where the victim is unaware of the loss. It's a betrayal of trust. And indeed, uh, I think it's a two level enhancement for abusing a position of trust. And I would say that the only way that you can commit fraud is if you are trusted. I've seen this before. I've seen a family, the owners of an auto dealership, looking extremely glum and extremely unhappy at the court uh, proceedings to do with the bookkeeper that stole $800,000 from them. My thoughts are, if you pay somebody 60000 and your control is that you simply trust them, when you lose 800000 you should look glum and unhappy. But... I'm not going to be all that sorry for you. Employees, employers need to make fraud schemes difficult to execute. If we keep going as we are, the only surprise will be that people are continually surprised when fraud happens. Let's just have a look at the end of chapter material. I had some good cases over here. We have three cases. The first one is the Nathan Mueller fraud scheme, and uh, Nathan and I published this article in the Journal of Accountancy. You can access the article and answer the questions that follow, and I believe this is a very good learning exercise. At the end here, I quote, we often logged on as somebody else to get the job done, and my question here is what analytics tests could be run to test whether employees are logging on as somebody else to get the job done. This requires students to, to think and to think rather carefully and to devise a test to get that. This one has to do with Vance Pearson of the United Auto Workers. And at the time, right as of now, we have more than 10 people indicted in a embezzlement and a lavish living scheme uh, to do with the United Auto Workers Union. Um, I just chose him. Um, and so it's a case of go through the indictment, see what an indictment looks like, see what the high life looks like when it is on the company's dime. Things like McCallan, 18 year old, are extremely expensive. Bud Light, not so much. Last one. 
We did the Richard Hatch tax evasion case, and that was in one of the earlier chapters. And so what I want students to do here is to read the Mike Sorrentino, Mike the Situation from Jersey Shore, and uh, to have a look at uh, his scheme. And indeed, his sentence was eight months. So we can go uh, back here. I've enjoyed these videos. I've enjoyed these reviews. Uh, maybe some of them I will redo as time goes by. But uh, that is the end of the chapter reviews. And so from me to you, it's bye-bye.